lift our hands and bow our knees and worship at your throne. We need you, Lord. We need you. Oh, 
and that one day we will stand before the great throne and give an account for who we are and how we live in light of that Father. And I pray based on that, Lord, every song we sing, every word that we declare would help move us toward the favorable way that we might hear you say, well done, Father. Not based on giving, not based on work service, but based on a life that has been lived out in accordance with your holy word. A life that has been lived out in surrender to you, Lord. Oh, God, I pray, Lord, that you would stir us like never before. Treat us like sons and daughters and minister to us. Spread us when we need it, Lord. Encourage us when we need it, Father. Lift us up when we need it, Father. Give us that that we need, Lord, that we might see homes turn around. Let husbands be saved, Lord. Let wives come under the army of the Holy Ghost. Let children fall in your feet, Lord, and cry out to you, God. We need it today in a desperate way. We need it like never before. Oh, God, I pray, Lord, open our eyes that we might see the times in which we live in. These are days of like never before. These are days of which, Lord, people never thought they would live, Father. But here we are, Lord, and our need for you is greater than ever been before. The church of hope is gone now, but we are here, Lord, and we need to get it right. We need to do it right. We need to represent you rightly, Lord. So help us, oh God. Spare us, Lord. Deliver us from death, works of religion. But raise us up, Lord, to the truth of your word. And we might be a light in this generation. That we might shine bright in honor and Father. And we'll be careful, oh so careful. We give you praise. I lift up your heart to heart candy that is scattered all over the city. But yet have joined us by way of media. Lord, I lift up those, Lord, who have just snuck in. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would do as only you can. Go through the airways. Take a word and minister, Lord, to hundreds of people by its thousands, Lord. Minister, Lord, let it not fall in vain, but let it be that which will cause hearts to turn to you. But we'll be so careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name. Amen.
devil can take your song, mm. you're defeated. Oh, yeah. You gotta have a song, even in the midnight. Sometimes some of my greatest crises, mm. I've overcome yeah. by way of singing a song that is so enriched with the word of God. Yeah, my soul is sustained. Mm. And I thank God for the power of a song. I preached that one time, the power of a song. Yeah. There's power in that song. That's why the devil work overtime to try to rob you of your song, because worship is important. It's the means by which the heart, the human heart, is tenderized. It's like taking that, that metal to that meat to get it tender. It tenders the heart so that the heart can receive and respond to what is precious, the word of God. I hope and pray you feel welcome. I feel welcome in the house of the Lord, for what the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And it's so glad. So good, so glad to be in God's presence with God's people. Those who are here and those who are connected with us, wherever you are, God blessings be upon you. And I trust and pray that you are being enriched in the word of God. It's a joy to always feel welcome into the house of the Lord and welcome around the people of God. And if you go to church and don't feel welcome, then that church is doing a, a poor job. Amen. People ought to be welcome. We love all people. We might not all think alike. Thank God we don't. Amen. 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 Thank God we all don't think alike. But we are all God's people. And it is a joy and a privilege to embrace God's people. I miss some of you so dearly. Can't wait to see and be together again. As we're going through this crisis and dealing with it, I'm learning more and more every day. And I'm trusting and depending on God in the midst of it all. God is still good. He's worthy and he keeps the people. Amen. He's always done that. If you're familiar with your book, I'm talking about the Bible now when I say the book. Amen. A lot of people are so unfamiliar with the book. If the crisis unfold, they fall apart. Mm. The Bible said, they that know they God shall be strong yeah. and do exploits. I believe God can give us strength. You hear last week's message? Even in this hour, you shall utterly fall. But they that wait, is that what he said? Upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Why do you think it needs to be renewed? You're human like me. It gives out. Ask your husband or your wife. It gives out. You need renewed strength. So many people are trying to live off of something that happened yesterday, five years ago, uh, some, some time ago, and it won't hold them today. Amen? What you got last year, last week, sustained you for then. You need something now. Amen? You need to be refreshed and restored now. Yes. Somebody say now. now. Praise the Lord. And that's what it's all about, yes. being restored. So uh, these things are uttermost important. Uh, it has been my passion in the last few weeks to labor for God. I, I mean, I've spent my time preparing to do what I do because this is what I'm called to do. But I, I feel a sense of greater urgency, a sense of greater alertness. And, and there's something people are missing in the world. Uh, what is events have unfolded, it really shows what the church has been spending its time doing uh, these last couple of years that we have had to prepare for our tomorrow. And what tomorrow unfolded proved we didn't really prepare people for what happened tomorrow. We were too busy enjoying what we were getting today. Yep. I'm not popular for saying that, but it's true. Yeah. And many of the people who took their Bibles and came to our churches were not grounded, were not rooted, were not properly discipled. And now they don't know how to handle a pandemic, an epidemic. The fear of it moved quicker than the pandemic itself. <laughs> but you don't need to move in fear. Amen. This is why God has given us these tools. I want to take time to pray before I get into our message. People are hurting. People are losing loved ones left and right. People are having to reconstruct themselves, reinvent themselves. Some are going through financial struggles they never experienced. Some are finding themselves having to start all over again. I talked to a lady and told me she lost her house. Some are losing their jobs and People are sick, regular things are going on, cancer is still falling. People need help, people need God. People need direction. 
some of this very church that we're connected with and we love are going through. Yeah. We need to be praying for them. Some of them are smiling on the outside and their marriage is under attack. Some are smiling on the outside and deep down within, fighting things. Yeah. Deep, deep. Yeah. And we need to pray for them. We need to pray one for another. The Bible says, if that's your fervent prayer of a righteous man, we'll pay the much. Yeah. So if you would join me as we prepare our hearts and pray. And ask God to look over the needs of those who are hurting, those who are sick, our elderly in this community who are so confined and yet in need. Fathers, we come before you. We come thankful that we can come and call upon you in this hour. Bring our great need for you. Knowing that you can and will. You have all power. You possessor of all things. We come with assurance knowing that we're bringing our condition and our situation and putting it in very capable hands. Hands that can do anything. You spoke in the beginning. You're still speaking now. But you take time, Father. Help us as we deal with the uncertainties of this life, as we deal with the things that are facing us and won't go away. Give us strength. Remind us of your word. Those that are sick, those that are bound, going through financially, those who are suffering loss, those who have lost loved ones and couldn't properly grieve like they wanted. Father, I ask for your passion to reach out to them. We live in a needy society. Some are filling that need with everything but you. Father, it's my sincere prayer to not this, just this pulpit, but all over the world, you will send a healing word. Send a word of comfort, and yet, Lord, send a word that convicts and compels the hearts of men. The hour we live in, it's time to get right with you. I thank you who you are and what you're doing. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do. We just lift up to you the cares of this nation. Father, we lift up our leaders. We lift up our families. Our passion for unsaved. Save them, Father. May they come in contact with the convicting message cause them to see their sin in the light of what you have said about it, that there will be a turn from it. Only you can touch and change hearts. And I pray, Lord, as we, we do the part you call us to do, be light in darkness. I pray that there will be such a working that will take place. The lives will change. Help me to see it and get it right. Do it right. Help us all. Help us all. As we quietly and patiently wait for you, I pray that your word, I pray that the word of God will take deep root in our hearts. That we might grow in God. As we are. Society and the world system that literally is moving fast toward destruction and doom. Yes. Help us keep our focus. Let us not be distracted to the past. Let us not get caught up in weariness while you call us to do well. Help us to finish strong.
This morning, I would like to share from you out of the book of the Revelation, chapter 1. The subject of my message is on a day like this. If you would honor the word of God and stand with me, please. Highest authority in the earth. John chapter 1, verse 9, 10, and 11. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the island of Patmos, in the island that was called Patmos, Patmos, for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet mm -hmm. saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book, send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and Samaria, and Pergamos, and Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Father, I pray as we minister your word that you would give us understanding, clarity of thought. He is to hear the heart and receive, mind to react. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Please be seated. The word of God is the highest authority in the earth. We certainly will stand and give an account, not based on our declaration of independence, not based on anything other than the infallible truth of this word. If anything you've heard me say and keep saying repet repetitively is how we must stand before God and give an account based on this book. John, who lived the oldest of the apostles, who could easily identify with tribulation, because he certainly goes through his fair share of it. But you notice he says, I'm your brother. I'm your brother. I'm your brother. I'm a companion in those who are suffering for this cause. And in the kingdom, I live under a certain guideline, a certain principle, kingdom principles. Not everybody lives that. These are your brothers and sisters who live under this kingdom principle, patiently waiting on the Lord. He says a lot right there. He said, I'm your brother, I'm a companion in suffering. So every time you go through something, you think you're alone, think about it. If you got a brother and a sister in Christ, they that live godly is going to suffer some kind of persecution. So get off that bandwagon, you're not alone. Somebody's suffering, and guess what? Even worse than you. So <laughs> you got a brother and a sister who understand what it means to hurt. John says this, and it's comforting to the church because sometimes while we're going through, we, we like to know, even if nobody can change it, we like to know somebody can identify yes, yes. with what we're going through. <clears throat> yes. As you listen in the kingdom, God's rule and authority, don't we need patience? The patience of being worked on today. We need patience like never before, and so many people. They, they, they're, they're not used to being patient, having to wait on something, having to wait for, for, for God even to move. And you know, like I know, God is not going to move like we push our buttons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when I push a button, things happen. And when they don't, I change the battery or something. You know, you don't change the battery on God. You have to wait. Yeah, yeah. We don't like that. Yeah. And isn't it wonderful that God will fix it where you have to wait? Yeah, yeah. Trust him in the midst of it. He'll put you there every time. Yes, he will. Yes, and then I always say, God don't want no children that won't trust him. Oh, These are my kids here. Guess what? I don't ever want them to not trust daddy. Yeah. I don't ever want them to not think daddy is going to be there. Patiently. You might have to wait, but it's coming. Because oh, yeah. I am daddy. Mm. And Mariah said amen. Amen. John said, I'm your brother. I'm your companion. I'm waiting. He said, I was in this place. Mm -hmm. now, now, waiting does not mean you're not going to go through. Because he's in the Isle of Patmos. 
And the reason for it was he took a stand for God. That, that happens, you know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Newsflash, standing for God is not going to keep you out of trouble. It's going to slide you right. You're going to get in some kind of trouble for being a witness for God. I don't care if you're 15 or in your 50s or 60s. You take that kind of stand, you might as well look out. It's coming. The surety of life is that they that live godly will suffer some kind of suffering for him. And I don't know what preacher got up and got the wind. I don't know what verse he used. He didn't look in the same book I looked in. He pitched it out there and told you, come up here. Give God your heart and give me your hand. And everything is going to be all right. I don't know where he read that at. He just lied to you. And the minute trouble comes, you left. Got mad and upset because you just didn't think people were going to suffer. Yeah. Many now thought the church would be raptured out and they wouldn't be here to go through such things as they're going through now. But in here, yeah. you have to represent him. Yeah. Well, John's on the Isle of Patmos. They tried to kill him. He wouldn't die. <laughs> Off of the word of God, testimony of the Lord. Mm. And he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. Yeah. He stops hearing things. I honestly believe every episode of his life led up to this episode that he's about to unfold a truth and see something he could not have seen before except he had walked with God with some consistency to the level of trust that God could take him into an area he had not gone before. He takes him into this area. It's in the spirit. Now I've heard a twist on this verse, you know. I was raised Pentecostal, so the Pentecostals explain being in the spirit a whole nother way. Justifying behavior that we have to tolerate and look at. But he's in the spirit. He's in a mindset. He's in a condition of obedience toward God. He's a spiritual man who is surrendered to the purposes of the Lord. He's in the spirit on the Lord's day. He actually has his mind on the Lord. You know, the folks used to sing that song, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stay. Some people only give in the spirit on the Lord's day. Every day is a day, but you know, Sunday they get a special mindset. They'll argue with their wife till they get to church, but then they walk in the spirit and the door. I'm not Come on, come on. They'll scream and holler at children, but get in the spirit when they come. <laughs> Come on, say it with me. I'm supposed to stay there all the time. Every day is the Lord's day. Every day is the Lord's day. Every day is the Lord's day. Yes, it is. We give special credence to Sunday and that great day. Some practice it on Saturday, whatever day we day decide it is, you know. John said, I was in the spirit and I started hearing a voice. On a day like this, I hear this. I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, first and the last. What you see, I want you to write. Patmos was an island about 10 miles long, six miles wide, in the Algene Sea, 50 miles Mesomelitis. And by now he is drunk from life's bitter cup. Well, the Lord told him he would. In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 22, Jesus said unto him, he said, you know not what you asked, and he just asked for something he wasn't really capable of asking for, but he asked for it. Uh, Jesus said, you don't know what you asked for. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? Talking about the suffering. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, we're able. And he said to them, you shall drink. Look at it. You shall. Yeah, it's coming, buddy. You're going to drink of my cup. You're going to be fellowshipped in the baptism with the suffering. I'm baptized with it. Sit on the throne on the right hand. It's not mine to give it. Given to them whom my father is prepared for. Yeah. We live in a day when suffering for the cause is going to increase mm -hmm. and is increasing mm -hmm. more and more. So you best likely say it with me. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get it out of your mind that you're not going to suffer. Yeah. Suffering is going to be there. It's going to increase. In 2 Timothy 1 and 8. 
Paul told Timothy, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. What did it mean actually for John? It's a day to be spiritual like we see in our day. Or we tend to get in that zone. John saw the day of the Lord. On a day like this, he saw the day of the Lord. He was in prison in chains, sitting there, suffering. They were trying to beat him and kill him. He hadn't died. And now he's sitting here, and he actually gets in the spirit. He hears on a most unlikely day from the world perspective, in a condition where the modern church says you don't even go. He's there. And yet, while he's there, he's not alone and he hears something. Mm -hmm. This is remarkable to me. Because even on a day like this in which we live, God is able to speak through it yeah. and to you. Just let that sit in. God is able to speak. John saw the day of the Lord throughout the Old Testament. We heard of his coming day of the Lord. Jesus will come and deal with all mankind. What John saw on this day would take him up into a realm where he would write so clearly what, what, what many now misunderstand. And he wrote it so clearly and yet so misunderstood by many. Some of these things John wrote when he saw it are some of the most misunderstood passages ever looked at in the Bible. And you can hear so many different spins on the book of the Revelation. So many variations of thought and conclusions. John heard a trumpet, the voice making declaration that only one could make. And that's why it's in red in most Bibles. In verse 11, he said, I'm Alpha and Omega, first and the last. John is enlightened on who is talking. Energy would understand this first and last things. Out of the Omega final authority is him. He is the highest authority. I love to say it like that. He's the highest authority in the earth. He said, what you see, I need you to write. And I need to send it out to the messengers of the church. Beginning, the Bible said, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Bible said, the Word became flesh. God became man. Thomas acknowledged him as God. In John 1, the Bible said, that's what we had in the beginning. The Word was with God and was God. John Thomas acknowledged him as Lord and my God. Jesus did not stop him for saying that. Mm -hmm. He acknowledged him as Lord and my God. Yeah. Uh, he made a statement about uh, being around before Abraham and they, they really was back. How could you do that? Because he, who was older than his mother, same age as his father, crept into the earth. Check it out. He, who was older than his mother, same age as his father, invaded the earth. God became man. And in John chapter 5, it's not on the screen. He made himself equal with God and it upset religious rulers of their day. John turned because he heard his voice. As he and in the book of the Revelation, in verse 12, John turned and saw it. And he saw the message of the church represented by these golden candlesticks. He see the message of the church in these golden candlesticks, but he's going to see in the center of it all. Verse 13 says, right in the middle of it all, he sees the, the Son of Man clothed. He sees 
him now in a glorified state in position in the heavens as the center and all of the messages of the church are in his hand. In the midst of the seven golden sticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot and girt about the patch with a golden girdle. His head and hairs were like white like wool, sound like Isaiah talking, huh? As white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet were like fine grass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand the hand of authority, the hand of protection, the hand of sovereign rule. He had those seven stars. And out of his mouth with a sharp two-edged sword, a word of authority, a word of compassion, and yet a word of judgment. And you know what I know. A two-edged sword had a greater advantage than a single-edged sword. Weapon of choice during the Roman days. What they miss going down, oh, we catch it coming up. Yeah. He gives the word of God this analogy as a two edged sword, and his confidence shining in his strength. The artists have tried to draw this, they couldn't draw it good as John wrote it. And you can go to all of the museums and look at all those wonderful pictures. If you can't go to a museum, I know we're on some kind of shutdown, but you can Google it and look at all those pictures they tried to depict, and you can see that John wrote it better than they could ever draw it because nobody can really grasp the true glory of what John saw and put it on tapestry. Yeah. Well, well, well. John wrote clear that they could imagine. A high priest is sitting there. Why seven? Every Jewish home has a menorah in it. Seven candles on a stand, which was in the temple to give light. Jesus stands in the midst of his church to give light to it, to give direction to it, to give focus to it. And when Jesus is no longer the focus, you have not a church. When Jesus is no longer the focus that is giving light to the church, you have not a church. You have somebody operating under a name, but they're not church. And I've heard other preachers say it, and I say it again, we need to give Jesus back his church. Amen. Get away from this stuff. Get away from these pursuits that is nothing but worldly religious stuff. Pursuits that have nothing to do with building the people. The church is like a lamp, ready to give light. Well, I know a little bit about electricity, and I know you can have a good bulb, you can have a good fixture, mm -hmm. but if you don't have power, Come on. it's not going to light up. I know 120 volt, I know about 480, I know about three phase lighting, I've seen all that, I put it together. Three phase lighting with, with 277 is, is great energy. But if you got the bulb and the wiring and all of that, no power, you're not gonna get no light. We need the power that illumines us for who he is and not what we want to do. We need the power in this generation. And if we don't labor to get the power, we will not get it. It will not be there. Yeah. Even on a day like this, the church needs to be visible. Yeah. Even on a day like this, the church needs to be functional. It needs to be accessible. People need to be able to hear and see and clearly understand that God is speaking to the world and to mankind. And he has a word for us. Church is to be a lamp, giving light to the earth mm -hmm. as Jesus is fueling the fire, yeah. keeping the fire going, yeah. showing people the way out of darkness and uh, looking for a way out of darkness. And there are people that need to see a way out. Mm -hmm. Nothing helps you mm -hmm. better than light. Light is important. 
Brother, we need the light of the gospel. We need it now. We don't need it all messed up together in a four-wall building. We don't spend more money than we need to spend for it. We need to get a little functional building and teach you how to be like where you work at, like where you are. We get light all together and we just light it up, you know, all, light, all break together. That's great. But when you get out from here and you work at the courthouse, you work at uh, the loans, you work at the hospital, you work wherever you are, we need your light shining bright there. Yeah. Amen. We need you illuminated yeah. at full capacity. Uh-huh. We need you strengthened at full strength. Uh-huh. We need you on guard and ready to give an answer of the reason of the hope that is within you. Everybody want to call their pastor. Everybody want to call their spiritual giant. God wants to make you a spiritual giant. Even on a day like this. When it looked like it's appropriate to go and hide and be weak. And God wants you to be light and strong. Stronger than you ever been before. Yeah. Amen. I want to ask a question. Do you show light? Amen. Do you show light? Now, now, I was raised, I, I can't help how I was raised, but I was raised. I was raised in a church where in order to be saved, mm. I call it this quick as a watch, too. Mm. In order to be saved, you had a checklist. Somebody said, check on it. Yeah. You had to be saved. You had to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Yeah. You had to receive the Holy Ghost based on the evidence of you speaking in tongues after you sat on the altar. That's the way I was raised. I'm sorry. I can't help that. That's just how I was raised. And when they gave testimony, mm-hmm. you had to remind them who you were. So you opened up by saying, I want to give honor to God who's first in my life. Yeah. And the meaning was first. You just said that. Uh, I want to thank the Lord for being here, for being saved, <laughs> sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, with a mighty burning fire. You went down that checklist, and then every now and then it, it shook, but it did something. <laughs> something to dance a little bit, and we checked it off. You okay? And we waited for everybody in there to do that. Everybody. I know some of y'all are watching now. That's okay. <laughs> but we waited on everybody to do that to prove who we were. Then we went to Walmart and time they didn't do us right. We fussed and cussed and everything but the right thing. Yes. Well, well, well. But in the building, yes. we check one, check two, check three. Come on. Uh-huh. We go down to Walmart and that lady don't do you right in the line. We got in the... I work in public service. Yeah. You want to get checked, you need to work with people. <laughs> Somebody say amen. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. I don't work in public service long enough to know. You're going to be saved, boy. You better pray for you to go up in there and yeah. stay in the Word because uh, they'll pull you into some flesh quick. Mm, amen. Amen. Do you show life? Do you show light? John saw what Daniel saw, a garment white as snow. Whoa, folks, what the church needs to see is people who've been transformed by the glorious gospel. Man, they done saw enough of that other stuff. And, 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 And now we've been reduced to where really all we have is the empowering word of God to get people. We can't bring them in and merchandise them. We can't have a big day, Wednesday, Wednesday, he day, she day, hat day, you know, mama day, everybody day. We can't raise money like we used to now. We've been shut down. Thank God. Amen. Maybe during this time we'll reevaluate what we've been doing and realize that we need to prepare people for life. Amen. Why are you too busy having a day trying to get your pockets fat? People are dying sitting on the pew. People are being directly in the choir and they're homosexual. You got this mess going on over there. I go to sing it, but I don't sing because I 
can't sing. I sing because I'm supposed to sing. I sing because of who it is that saved me and delivered me and brought me off a crack alley and straightened me up. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the Mary and I are looking at this little plump fella. Yeah. You didn't know the little 110 pound drug addict that was strung out on drugs and everybody gave up on me. Everybody said no, but God never gave up. You can't make me down. I know I get my own back there. You can't make me down. I know. He'll make you light in the midst of darkness. Don't lose the light. Don't lose sight of this description. Many functions take place. The word is quick and powerful. You have to have a grasp of the Word of God. The Word is quick and it's powerful. Hear me, dear folks. Those of you who are watching, somebody will turn me off already because, you know, this ain't the kind of message make people really, you know, people like to be entertaining. You gotta stop that, really. Yeah. We were wrong for doing it. Yeah. We were wrong for entertaining you. We should have educated you. Yeah. We should have taught you how to live. Yeah. How to eat better, how to be yeah. healthy, how to manage it, all that. We should have taught you. Yeah. We should have taught you kingdom principles and living. We didn't do that. And many of us died. We kept hollering people being targeted. People ain't being targeted. While you were so busy trying to rebuke everything else, you should have rebuked some of them Twinkies you shouldn't have been eating. Yeah. All that fat nasty stuff. Yeah. You should have rebuked that. Yes. I'm not being fun. I'm not trying to make fun of people. Yeah. I'm just telling you what should have happened. We should have been rebuking all that wildlife, serious living mm, well. in the name of the Lord. <laughs> the word is the ability. The writer of Hebrews, some say it was Paul, we're not sure. It kind of sounds like it, you know, but he said the word is quick. Yes, it is. The word of God is quick and it's powerful. Yes. Let me tell you something. Anyone who applied themselves to the word of God will quickly find their room to change. That word gets in there. Change. There's no dual residency. No, that word will drive it clean out. It's quick and powerful. And look at this. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, 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 I learned that the, 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 the Greek behind this verse is literally explaining that whatever attaches itself to you and is there and should not be there, the authority of the word gets in there and it severs, it takes it from your heart. So that stuff you couldn't quit doing, that word gets in there and gives you power. It severs that connection to your soul. So the man with lust, the person with issues of unforgiveness and all of these traits that will not be in the believer's heart, you get in the word and there's no way that stuff is going to live there. It will it'll separate it. Separated out of you, but get it out of you. Those who spend time in the Word of God will find the sinfulness of their life change. Because yes, that word will divide. Yes. I love the end part of this. Separating. Dividing the sun that has been separating me. Soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our wicked heart. You don't want to admit it, but it is. Yes, Desperately wicked. And I'm telling you, even through this pandemic, we've seen the selfishness, the hearts of people hoarding up stuff like ain't no tomorrow. The merchants just love it. Just hoarding up stuff, buying stuff, can't find toilet paper. I don't know how that got started. Can't find stuff. People hoarding meat shells, empty man, and they're hollering, there's going to be even greater prices of food on the shelves, and people just, just having a, a day of selfishness. Mm. Well, the human heart has proven to be so wicked. Yeah. The life that's been displayed is proven to be so vile. Yeah. <clears throat> so vile. The word is quick and powerful. John that saw Jesus walking on the earth, now he sees him up in heaven. John got a twofold blessing. 
Now he's describing him in his glorified state. And even though he had been around him on the earth, it holds no comparison to what he sees in glory. Amen. It's not the same Jesus, John, is it? No. It blew his mind. John said, when I saw him in verse 17, he said, I fell on my face. Yeah. I fell at his feet. Yeah. He raised me up and said, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive. Say that with me. Evermore. Evermore. Allah is in the grave. Buddha in the grave. Yeah. John Smith, all them folks are in the grave. We have the risen Savior that got up out of that grave because death did not have the legal right. So by the power of his holiness, he came up and took keys with him. Amen? And forevermore he stands in that position. I am he that liveth, was dead, I am alive forevermore. And look what I got. I got keys. Now let me tell you something. I know something about this key business. I work in transportation industry and I went to go get in a vehicle. So I had to inspect the vehicle and get it ready. When I'm in there with this key, it's not moving. Nothing's happening. I'm mad and I'm frustrated. I finally looked and realized I got the wrong key trying to get into something. Come on, I got the wrong key, but I want it to work where I'm at. Yeah. Do that sound familiar? Yeah. People got the wrong key to life, but yet they're trying to make it work. Yeah. And while you're frustrated trying to turn this thing in and wiggle it and get it to work and it won't work and steady, trying to use the wrong key to get somewhere that won't get you there, going in the wrong direction that will never get you where you need to go, trying to turn the key. Jesus said, I got the key, and until you come to me and get these keys, you'll not be able to unlock the door. And there's some people that want to unlock doors, doors that are locked and privileged a hell back from them. And you need those doors open. You need that doorway so you can go in and experience the fellowship with him. You need that doorway open of your stony heart so that he can get in there and change it. You need that key. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. Trying to get the key in. Trying to get in some other kind of way. What would it mean to you and I, Jesus have both these keys, the doorways into eternity. There are four keys in the hand of God that are not trusted to others. The key of the rain, the key of provision, the key of the grave, and the key of the barren womb. Those of you who know your Bible experience God unlocking the heavens and pouring down rain. We see God unlock keys of provision and provide. Even in the wilderness. Am I right? Yes. Even in the wilderness. Yes. Anybody been in their own wilderness and yes. God provided? Yes. I told you I lost my job. I was an electrician making $25 an hour. I lost my job. Hear me well, y'all. Lost my job. Two car notes, house notes. God paid off one of those cars while I was laying off. And every day, God provided. I didn't have a big drop here, a big drop there. It was something here, something there. God opened this door, opened that door, touched this heart, touched that heart. But after a, a, a eight-month period, it seemed like God had took care of me better. I told my wife, look like we're doing better now than when we were when I was making $25 an hour. Yeah. Well, no. Tell me God can provide. And man, I preached every day. The folks didn't know I was broken and I don't know what. And I was going all over preaching. I was sharing the faithful at Heart to Heart Ministry. I was ministering the word of God. And boy, you thought I was rich. I was rich in heaven's goods. I didn't have the worldly goods and didn't need them. I had what to stay and keep. And I never would have never been hungry. Come on now. God takes care of his children. Yes, he will, man. I love the way the writer said it. I once was young, now I'm old. I got some experience. I can look people in the eye and tell them, I know the Lord will provide. You just got to be patient and wait and be willing to let God do what he do best. Thank you, Lord God. Well, the key of provision, we 
We've seen God unlock that key, yeah. that door. Yeah. We've also seen him unlock the door of the grave. Yeah. I'll never forget. My mother-in-law, Tawanda Mom, we're out fishing. That woman died right in front of me. She died. I watched her die on the fish creature. Boy, I got a history with the fish creature. She died. Thank God she died at the place where we were, not around the corner from where rescue was. They come running. They hit her with that thing. Boom, boom. They hit her three times right there on the pier before they lifted her up. Got nothing. Picked her up, put her on the gurney, and took her into the rescue and said, call whoever you can. I watched them as they got her inside. They couldn't even close the door. They had to hit her again. Boom. They tell us they hit her so many times, the pressure of it is what messed her eyes up. We only learned that after. She was out for days, but God raised her back, weaned her back. How much God do that? I'm praying and I'm praying, God, I just got this woman out fishing. We just enjoying ourselves and we just having a good, peaceful time. And this happens. Oh, God, we prayed and cried. And God not only brought her back, she lived another six years with us. Like, and they said she never gave to eat. Being out that long without any oxygen, she wouldn't be able to function. Her brain would be dead. Y'all saw Mother around here singing and jumping and praising the Lord because God did it. He unlocked death's door. Come on now. Amen. And we didn't have a Benny Hill revival to see it happen. Come on now. We just call on the name of the Lord. Amen. So many people try to manipulate things. You don't need to manipulate nothing. Just let God be God. And He saw him. Yeah. But God was so soft fit to take her in. That was God's business. Yeah. But God so soft fit to show us his power and raise her back. Yeah. And her doctor even said she won't be able to eat. They were trying to feed her that hospital food, you know. So I would say, I'll get her to eat. She made some cornbread and some collard greens. And we took it up there and sopped that cornbread. Yeah. You got to be a little old folks who are different. Yeah. When that stuff hit her lips, my mouth went wide open. <laughs> that little pureed stuff they were trying to give her, she wasn't happy, man. She, <laughs> she was pushing that out. But man, that cornbread and that pot licking, that's, that's old talk. That pot licking hit her mouth there, went wide open. Mama started eating again. Mama started walking. Next thing we know, we got mama home and enjoyed her for six more years. I know that was a God. Yes. He unlocks the grave. Yes. And then we've seen God mm. lock up a wound on, only to unlock it later on. Yes. Hannah wound locked up. Come on. Yes. Rachel, God locked it up. Yes. Opened it up when he got ready. Yes. Uh -huh. Did all he wanted. Tried his best. Couldn't yes. do nothing. Gave her a handmade everything. Couldn't have it. When Rachel, no. Yes. God locked it up. And when God got ready, he mm. took the key. Woo, man, that's exciting stuff. Yeah. It'll take the key and turn it on you. That's what some of y'all think you cannot produce and do. God will perhaps, in the sovereignty, if it is his will, unlock that door. Yeah. What about Abraham and Sarah? Yeah. All those years of youth, nothing happened. Yeah. All those years of youth. I'm sure they had good relations. Nothing happened. God waits until they get old. Mm. Mm. Sarah laughing. laughing. Abraham scratching his head. God unlocks the door. You, Tell me God can't work. Y'all know when I bring that up, I always love to mess with our elderly saints. And they always wave me off. I used to ask my mother-in-law, I said, you think God will use you like he did Sarah? No. Nope. My day is over. I had my 11, 12 head cheering up. <laughs> He's the love of you, you know. What if God decided he's going to use you like Abraham? He ain't going to use you like that. <laughs> but God can unlock those doors. And those are just a few of many in any door. He can unlock. Do you not know that God has the key that can save us from this virus? He can drop that down to somebody if he want to. And whether he do or don't, we still have to trust him. God knew this was coming. This is not a surprise to him. It caught us up, God. Come on now. Mm. Yes, Lord. And there were some people that were saying something like this was coming. Yeah. yeah. Many people were calling God. Yeah. yeah. God has the keys. Come on now. And let me tell you something. 
comes. When you are in connection with the person who has the keys, your access is just as good as his. Amen. My kids are small. We go home. They didn't have the key to the house. They wanted to get in the house. They wanted to enjoy the things in the other house. But because they were with daddy and I had the key, I could unlock the door. We could go in and enjoy the benefits of that house. Amen. You're with your father. You ain't got the key, but he got the key. That's good enough. Somebody say, that's good enough for me. As long as he got the key, he can unlock the door. Fire me. God got a key to a job. God has the key. Take the house. I get another one. God has the keys. He can unlock any door. John has fallen to his feet. While many in arrogance claim they had such encounters with God, and they too tired of hearing these folks lie. Wow. Come on, let's just tell it for what it is. Ain't you tired of hearing these folks lie? Wow. Mm -hmm. God got on national TV and put it all on social media, you know. He had such power and authority and clout with God, he was going to blow COVID-19 clean off the earth. Wow. And he had his people stand. It's on, go, go look it up, you don't believe me. His name is Kenneth Copeland. I don't mind saying his name. He stood up there and he said some kind of prayer and called COVID-19 out and said by the authority of me, I'll blow you clean off the earth. And he blowed, he spit more than he blowed. He, he blowed COVID-19 off the earth. COVID-19 didn't go nowhere. Well. And people are still sending them money. You know what he said after that? Don't you stop tithing. Don't you stop supporting your church. Because mm -hmm. wow. I'm sure he's on another plane or another mm -hmm. big house somewhere. Kind of stuff hurts me. The nonsense that went on as things were being said of people who did not have the mind of God, the word of God. People were coming up with all kind of craziness, and folks were believing it. Yeah. This would get mean. These are people that came to Bible study. I guess they were sleeping or something, weren't paying attention. They, they, they were believing it. Yeah. Buying into it. I'm like, are you that weak? This is why I say our churches need to realign our focus and get it right, man. Amen. Come on, preacher, this is it. We have to really prepared people for these kind of times. And if they have gripped them so, they won't even come together. Yeah. Yeah. Staying at home is the new way now. Uh -huh. I used to always say this home church, when you look at it on the screen, I, I never thought it would come to this like this. Mm. And some people love it. No accountability like that. There's no real accountability like that. And for those of you that love it like that, you don't check. Mm. Wow. You'll like me to be exposed to somebody that knows the word of God so they can help you. Because mm. I am Come on, say it. I am yeah. How can I benefit you from a distance? Come on now. Well, John. Worship. He's never seen Jesus like this before. Peter saw him and he was humble. Isaiah saw it and said, Woe is me. I'm undone. A true revelation of Jesus and who he is brings sin to the perspective it needs to be. And this is what has happened. This is where we're at fault at. We have not properly represented him to the point. People feel about sin what they need to feel. Until it comes, woe is me. We're not doing nothing. I don't care. Ah, ah, or you go on. Until you feel sin and the weight of it and how grievous it is to a holy God. We're just going through the motions. You got to go fishing in now. Until we feel about ourselves what we need to feel. I don't care how pretty you dress up. Until we say, woe is me. I'm undone until we come to that conclusion that we say, I am a wretch. That's my wife sung in that song. I'm a flower quickly fading. Here today and gone tomorrow. Instead of being pumped up with so much pride and false hope, based on your profession that you made when you were eight years old, you never really possessed anything, but you professed everything. Wow. We even told you to buy the book, The Power of a Positive Profession. No, you need to know how to possess. Start with the Word of God. Amen. 
And so you might see yourself, all oh, right, this, this is very exciting, I can tell you. John sees him. Isaiah says, woe is me. Peter saw his net filled up with fish and said, Lord, you got to get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Mm. Saul was knocked on his knees, knocked off his horse. You know, I, I love, you know, yeah, churches, they had a fallout experience. Great, fallout. I used to fall out too, and I fall. Uh, if you fall, you got to get up different. Come on now. You can't just keep falling and getting up being the same, doing the same. You got to fall and have some power. You didn't have when you went down. I don't think you went down under no power. You just went down because you wanted somebody to touch you. Well, maybe they, some of these preachers didn't even push them down now. I mean, we got to fall out happiness now, man. Just push them down now. It's ridiculous, man. Y'all don't know me. I very rarely call people up here for prayer. And if I pray for you and you fall, you better be falling under no spirit. And I ain't trying to make nothing happen. I am grown past the point of trying to prove anything. If God knocked you down, you better get up with something that shows us that God knocked you down. Your husband ought to be able to say, you're more loving now. Your wife ought to be able to say, you're more compassionate now. Your husband ought to be able to say, she don't scream no more. Hallelujah. Your wife ought to be able to say, he don't go outside my head no more. And unless that happens, you haven't had an encounter where God has changed you. Yeah. <laughs> he has to change you. Yeah. And if he don't change you, stay there until he comes. Ask him to change you. Ask him to change you to the point you know you got changed. Ask him to change you to the point your mama would call your daddy and say, I don't know what happened tonight. Some preacher got him brainwashed. No, I ain't been brainwashed. I got touched by God. And God took the case away. God took the habit away. And a touch will do it. Yeah. A touch will do it. A touch will straighten you up, baby. A touch will change it all around. Modern church needs an awareness of Jesus. We need an awareness that Jesus is in charge. We need to let him be in charge. Stop trying to control everything. I don't got no board of deacons kicking me out of nothing. I kick them out. We need a, a, a church where Jesus finally has control over. There is, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you here. There is a lack of reverence and pride, I must say, starting in our pulpit, have invaded our churches. That's our pride. Our pride. These suits, these little shoes, our little speaking ability, our ability to move people with our words, that blew my mind. Man, who told you to go on an ego trip? Jesus said, if I, I be lifted up, I'm drawn in on you. I didn't say for you to lift you up. I did not say for you to get on some kind of trick to just stop talking about how I give them down, how I move them down. These are not your people. These are God's people. You're an under shepherd. And you're supposed to be about the care of the sheep, not to be a wolf or a hyrule. You're going to stand for it. You're going to give an account for it. And it'll be a compartment in hell special for y'all. But you're better He 
You would be free yet by choice to surrender to the work of the Spirit to take him on a day like that into a heavenly vision. You need, number one, a fresh attention, a very fresh attention to his voice. Read your Bible. Amen. Say it with me. A lot. A lot. Turn off the days of our lives. <laughs> Burning world. What's the other one? Oh. <laughs> you know it. <laughs> As the world will turn. The young and the rest. Come on. And the price is. Right. Come on. Y'all know I'm Y'all know I'm here. Uh, you got to turn that off. Mm. You got to turn it off. Amen. And give God some of your time. Yeah. Now that's older people stuff. Mm -hmm. To young people, you got to turn the video game off. Mm. You got to turn your love for that stuff off mm. and get in the Word of God. Wow. It is that lack that keeps our ear out of connection. How you gonna know him? You don't know his word. Yeah. Come on. How you gonna know him? You don't know his word. Yeah. When you don't know his word, you'll fall asleep when I'm talking like this. Wow. I get real high up, you'll wake up. Mm -hmm. You know why? We raised a church full of spiritual junkies. Yeah. And to survive, wow. I gotta give you a hit like I needed when I was on crack. Wow. I gotta give you a hit. Mm -hmm. I needed a hit so bad when I was on drugs that mm -hmm. I'd do anything to get it. You didn't want to know me back then. Because I had to have my fix. And in church today, what's going on right now? I can take it to some of them when we get out of this. Just get started. They get tuned up, amped up, right up, and that's what's going to survive. When they come down, they're going to be so full out because they don't have time. You need a fresh attention to his voice. You have to read your Bible. And for the first time, you got more time than you ever had before. Come on now. They told you don't go nowhere. Yeah. How you explain to God you didn't have time now? Come on. Come on. Yeah. Come on. How you gonna explain now you ain't had no time? Some of you done got laid off your home. Mm. Can't do nothing about it. Open up your book. Come on. Yeah. This is the time now. Yeah. My Lord, even the president had one of the corporate giants. When he had all of them there, one of them snuck that in. He didn't know it was coming. But he got up and said, look, y'all, our company is dedicated to producing whatever it was there. I think it masks or sanitizer, whatever. And then he said, well, let me throw this in while I'm here. We have left God out. I'm like, hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody plug it in. We've left God out, and this is a good time now. While we're shut down, and I love the way he said that, to get back in our Bible and get back to God. And I'm telling you, y'all, this shutdown is a blessing in this Bible alive. You need a fresh perspective of Jesus 
Christ, the loving, saving, and judging Christ. And then foremost above all, you need a fresh experience of worship. Thank you, Lord God. Not just the singing. You need a fresh experience of worship. Number three, you need that fresh experience of worship. Not just singing in the church, but the lifestyle of obedience that honors God. Lifestyle of obedience that honors him. Singing is important. Worship, devotion to him is vital. Worship the obedient lifestyle that honors him. Then, on a day like this, you'll be able to hear his voice and understand what it is we must do in order to survive days like this. I talk to people who went through horrors. Horrors. I'm not making light of what they went through. Some fell apart in the midst of it. And some, the only reason why they survived a day like this is because they knew God. They didn't wait to know him while going in the storm. They knew him before they got in that storm. When they got in that storm, even though it was horrible and the days unfolded was wicked, they were able to be held together because they had a word, they had worship, they had a fresh experience with him. They weren't living off of what happened many years ago. They were sustained because they knew God. They had his word. Their Bible was more than just that book that sit on the dash of their car Monday through Friday. Then they pull it out on Sunday. Big old Bible, man. Big old leather cover. Spent no money for it. They won't even read it and enjoy it. What's going to help you on a day like this is that you spend time getting to know him. You spend time in his presence. Then you'll hear his voice. You won't fall apart on these kind of times. Man, I love talking to my Christian brothers and sisters who have so much faith, have so much strength during these times on a day like this. And then I talk to some and my heart grieves my sister. They fall apart, they cry, they whine, they don't know what to do. Come on, you don't mean to tell me you don't know what to do. You can serve God and pray. Man, give God praise and thank you.
scripture worships. This thing is weeding out, ain't it? It's weeding out. It's weeding out the, the, the true worship was from those that are just, just, just kind of connected, you know? It's, it's weeding out. Now you gotta weed through the crowd to find somebody really talking faith. You call them to check on people, you gotta call 10 saints just to get two. That's encouraging. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, but I'm not trying to down. I'm just telling you what's happening. There's a reason for it. They were so busy doing all of that, that, that info stuff. I'm not against you. Good time. Y'all know me. But man, you need something that's going to hold you. B.B. Mm -hmm. King, can I borrow him for a minute? Yeah. B.B. King said, when the thrill is gone, come on now. Mm -hmm. What you going to live off? Mm -hmm. The hour coming now is yeah. the true worship. Stand with me. I want to pray. Close this out. Father, seek such. Even on a day like this. Do you have it? Father, we come knowing that you have power to change. But you won't force change. Repentance is not an option. It is a commandment from you. You command that even in the pulpit we repent. Father, if I be willing, I pray that there would be others that would be willing to say, I'm sorry for my part. Help me. Help me. Help us. That we might get this right. I believe this is our opportunity. This is our season. This is our hour. We can experience revival and change. But what we've done to prepare people, Lord, embarrassingly, has not prepared them. And while many are falling apart, going back to worldliness and moving further away from the things of Christ, Lord, our eyes are open to see our failure. And I ask that you forgive me. And I ask that you would help me as a father, as a husband, as a pastor, as a layman, as a brother. Help me to get it right. Yes. Help me to do it right. I pray that it would be embedded in the hearts of those here and all connected with this. Lord, a, a greater love for your word, a sense of urgency to get in the word and pray, call on your name. We need it. That's it. We need it. So, Lord, I pray for everyone here. I pray for their homes. I pray for their individual situation. Meet need in their life. Open doors. No man can shut them. Shut doors no man can open. Cause through personal, very intimate, sweet time with you. Fellowship to be enriched. Hearts to be uplifted. Eyes open. That we might see you even on a day like this. Lord, who would ever thought? But yet as we are here, Lord, our, our eyes are fixed on you. And we thank you. We thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to respond to it. If you're not saved, you need to get in a hurry. If you are saved, and maybe you would admit, maybe you would let your pride down and say, look, man, I'm guilty. I've not spent quality time in the word, even with a shutdown. I got more time now and more at my excuse expense. I could have even had the word playing for me on my phone. I could have had it talking. I could have just read along. I, no excuse. I'm just sorry and lazy. Forgive me, Lord. I'm going to get up off my lazy spiritual do nothing and I'm going to get busy again. Maybe that's you and you were resolved that I'm going to get in the word of God. I'm going to have a real relationship with Jesus and when life do what it do, I'm going to have something that will grip and hold me. I won't make a fool of myself and embarrassment to others. I'm going to stand clear and firm on the word of God. And I'm going to do it today. I'm not going to wait till tomorrow. I'm going to start by saying, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Let me. Let me get it right. We thank you and we pray to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated going home. I pray you are blessed and enriched. I thank God for all he is doing and doing. We love you. There's nothing you can do about it. Pray God bless you.